conference going? Yeah? We certainly want to thank uh, NBCSL staff, uh, uh, Paula Hoisington and Joe Grant in particular, for this outstanding conference thus far. So let's give them a round of applause. So we, are, we will continue our discussion in regards to clinical trials and the syphilis study. But first, let's bless our foods. And for that, we're going to have a representative, uh, Dr. Harold Love. Let us pray. Gracious God, we once again thank you for what you've done for us this day. We thank you, God, for sustaining us through our sessions thus far. We ask now, Lord, that you would bless the food we're going to receive for the nourishment of our bodies and souls. It's our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Representative Love. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Representative Peblin Warren come to the stage. Uh, Representative Warren was elected to the Alabama House of Representatives on March 2005. She currently serves on the Ways and Means General Fund Rules and Health Committee and also the Lee County Delegation. Uh, Representative Warren is a graduate of Tuskegee University. Representative Warren. Good afternoon, everyone. As always, I have to admit that truly this is the day that the Lord has made, and we have so much to be thankful for. As an alumnus of Tuskegee University, Tuskegee Institute, um, state representative for District 82, and a member of the Board of Trustees at Tuskegee University, it gives me pleasure to introduce our speaker for you today, Dr. Reuben C. Warren, is a professor and director of the Tuskegee National Center of Bioethics. Dr. Warren earned his undergraduate degree from San Francisco State University, his dental degree from Meharry Medical College, and both master's and doctorate degrees from the Harvard School of Public Health. He also completed a two-year residency at Harvard School of Dental Medicine and Dental Public Health. He is board certified in dental public health. Dr. Warren also completed a Master of Divinity from the Interdenominational Theological Center with a concentration in theology and ethics. It's truly a pleasure to sit back and listen to the information that Dr. Warren has for you today. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm not eating, and I'm keeping this mask on so y'all will know that the virus is alive and well. And it is impacting on all of us, regardless of who we are or regardless of who we think we are. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling overwhelmed. Beyond the virus, hear me clearly, behind the virus, because the virus is going to do what it's going to do. And I'm sure you know that another variant just emerged. And I suspect more are on the way. Beyond the virus, though, those of you who are committed to justice social justice must also be committed to improving black life. And I want to be real clear that the real issue is not the virus. The real issue is improving black life. And the virus is a threat to black life. And I'm not saying only to black life, but particularly to black life. The data are clear. 
who's suffering disproportionately from this threat. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the virus. When you see me with this mask on, it's to remind you of what you're supposed to do after you get the weeding. The court decision in Wisconsin was, I started to say surprising, not surprising, but shocking, a threat to black life. But there was some accountability, not justice, some accountability in Charlottesville, Virginia, and in Brunswick, Georgia. I know the struggle for justice for black people is both within, within and outside of government. And I respect those of you in public service. I spent some time in state government in Mississippi, and I spent some time in the federal government in Atlanta. But what is clear to me in terms of health, that the state legislators control the health of the people in that state. Don't get it confused. It's not the federal government. It's you that control the health of the folks inside your geography. And I'm, I'm not saying citizens. I'm saying everybody who's living where you're working. I respect your work, and I know that you're working 24-7 for justice. And I know you must be tired. I spent most of my career in public health, in the public sector, both in state and local government. I started my work in 1972. When I started, I was a young blood. And now they call me OG. <laughs> but, but, but I'm OK with that. Because I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy, but it brought me too far to leave me. Y'all know about that. The hymnologist's song, those words, may have been said some time ago, but they're applicable for today. I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. You see, I started in South Central LA. I'm from Watts. Very proud. No matter where I be, I'm from Watts. I started my brief remarks before I start them. I must commend you for your serious response to the coronavirus. I got a call saying, you can't come unless you show me you've been vaccinated. Send me your card. You can't show up. And I sent them my card. But let me remind you again, the card says what you're supposed to do. What you do is what's more important. You know, I've attended four or five events since March. No, it was three. This is the third event since March 2020. And in the past, I was doing four to five a month, showing up and trying to show out. I've not been on an airplane since March 2020. But you know, I, I came here particularly because the voices for our fathers referred me to you. You know, I've been doing public work since 1972, and the pandemic is among the greatest public health threats that I've experienced. I've been through all of them. This is the greatest. But it's not the virus. Hear me clearly. It's not the virus. It's human behavior. It's what you do for those you care about. Your theme, prioritizing solutions to challenges, in our community is indeed a timely thing. Yes, we must prioritize solutions, but we must be very clear, however, about what solutions work and what don't, which ones don't work. Because folk will tell you anything, but if there's not a science base to undergird what they tell you, be thoughtful. My specific charge 
is to address truth, transparency, and reconciliation. I'm going to do that in about 10 minutes. For me, there can be no reconciliation without reparations, and there can be no tr reparation without truth. And, without, and for truth, you've got to have transparency. So what and where is the transparency? While I know not what should preparations include, I believe that there are due, no, no, overdue nonetheless. I spent 20 plus years at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I joined CDC in 1988 after the United States Health and Human Services Department published a 1985 Secretary's Task Force report. And it was, for, it was the first time that the federal government admitted that morbidity and mortality, death and dying, could be chronicled by race and ethnicity. And I didn't say caused by, could be counted by your race and your ethnicity. Uh, right now I can look around and tell you that you know somebody who's had cancer. You know somebody with heart disease, diabetes, cirrhosis of the liver. You know somebody who's lost a baby prematurely. You know somebody with HIV and AIDS. You know somebody. And in a different room with a different demographic, that may not be the case. You know somebody. So the numbers that I studied at CDC changed in the names of people that I know. That's what's going on with the pandemic. And those deaths, hear me clearly, are needless deaths. And regardless of your education, your income, your position, black folk are going to die, are going to be sick disproportionately compared to other folk. And I said 85, in 1985, there were 60,000 people who died prematurely, black folk. Now, I joined the federal government in 88 to help address what was in the Secretary's Task Force report. Well, in 2005, David Satcher, and you know that name if you don't act like you do, head of the study that said, what has changed since 85? So in 2005, the 60,000 excess deaths had increased to 83,000. We spent more money, more information was shared, more research was completed, and more black folk were dying. You know, you asked me to talk about the, the Center for, the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare that's at Tuskegee, that's where I work. But I couldn't do that in a vacuum. Let me give you the context for that important center where I spend every day of the week. You need to understand why the center was started to understand why it must continue. There were three major historical occurrences that preceded the establishment of the center. Let's start with the Middle Passage and the enslavement of African people in the Western Hemisphere, 1619. Although we were in North America as early as the 1400s, shall slavery devalued black bodies attempting to deconstruct black life? Secondly, you all heard about the American eugenics movement. It provided a class and a race-based assessment to suggest that black folk were something different. And different then mean, meant less than. Eugenics started in Europe, but it did not have a race component until it got to the United States. And you know, some folks said that W.E. Du Bois was supporting the eugenics movement. That's a lie. And that's been refuted by scientists, both black and white, scholars, both black and white. Some of you, and I can look around and know that you've experienced Jim Crow, segregation, and so-called integration, and other forms of individual, institutional, and systemic racism and bigotry. We in the Deep South, and you know, we were here, brought here, to meet the needs 
of white folk. And part of our struggle is to meet our needs as well. In the early 1900s, syphilis was rampant throughout the United States. In 1929, the Rosenwald Fund, you may remember Sears and Roebuck, piloted a study in Macon County to treat syphilis. They were treating syphilis, but because of the depression, they stopped treating folk. And the federal government decided to continue, but it was not continued to be a treatment, but it would be an observational study. We wanted to see how syphilis impacted on black life. And I heard you, somebody said earlier, we can't call it the United States Public Health Service syphilis study. We got to still call it the Tuskegee syphilis study. Let that go. Because Tuskegee syphilis study suggests that Tuskegee was the main player. So every time you say Tuskegee, related to that study, you think about Tuskegee Institute, the city of Tuskegee and Macon County, let that go. Say it clear, the United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, that's the name. The real name was the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male in Macon County, Alabama. Let me give you three things to remember about that. It was Tuskegee to imply that Tuskegee was behind it. It was untreated, which means they never intended to treat the folk. And it was black males to suggest that only black folk had this disease. So you see why it's important to unpack that name and say it right? So wrestle with it. Call it what it is. Just, just bear with me. The United States Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee said. Syphilis study at Tuskegee. Just, just work with that. The more you say it, the more you'll know it, and the more you'll embrace it. It was the most unethical and inhumane study in US history. The most. And you heard earlier the consequence. And I also want you to stop calling them folk, the men who were in that study, victims. They weren't victims. They are not victims, they're heroes. And the more we talk about them, the more we know about their con tremendous contributions to health and health care. You also heard the name attorney Fred Gray, African-American lawyer who took on the federal government on behalf of the men. Attorney Gray is 90 years old, still practicing law in Tuskegee. Hear me clearly, I don't feel no ways tired. Let me spend the last five minutes talking about the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Healthcare, which is a part of the settlement. Yes, the, the, the men and their families did get some, some dollars, not enough. So the compensation still needs to continue. It's not anymore, but the struggle continues. As a part of the settlement, President Clinton said that we need a center at Tuskegee University to prevent that from ever happening again. And let me say this also that when you say the Tuskegee syphilis study in the public or the private sector, you ain't called Tuskegee because you don't say that in Tuskegee. You call it like it is. So when you hear on the, the media about the Tuskegee syphilis that they ain't called us, refer them to us and we'll clear it up. The vision of the Biotech Center is shaping the future to, for promoting optimal health. Shaping the future to promoting optimal health. Our mission is to enhance social justice and the well-being of African Americans and other health disparity populations through research, education, and community engagement in bioethics, public health ethics, health disparities, and health equity. And what I know is that the states have the major responsibility for doing that. And for me, that means you have that responsibility for doing that. 
You have, as Mayor Neal says all the time, you've got the power. So use it. Use it. And there's a lot of misinformation, and this is not the time to clear it up. But all I can say, if you want to know about what happened, call the Tuskegee. We can clear it up, and we can clear it up with evidence, with history, and with research. So don't be confused about where you find out what you need to know. Call Tuskegee, and we can clear it up. And let, let me conclude by, by once again saying how important you are to what we're doing, how important what you do is to what we're doing. I've, I've, I've had the blessing to be in several states, and in each time, the state legislators, the black state legislators, were the way to success. And I don't start calling names, because I'll miss some names, but I've been in California, I've been in Tennessee, I spent a lot of time in Mississippi, and now in Alabama. So just know that uh, we can do this, we must do it, and without you, it cannot be done. Thank you and God bless. Please continue to enjoy your meal. We're going to continue with the program since we are a few minutes behind time so that we can get back on schedule. So uh, our next speaker is Ms. Jo A. Valentine. She's the Associate Director, Office of Health Equity in the Division of Sexually Transmitted Disease Prevention, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She has worked in the Division of Sexually Transmitted Disease Prevention since September of 1991. Uh, currently, her primary responsibilities include leading efforts to reduce STD disparities in the United States and promote health equity, overseeing the Tuskegee Health Benefits Program, and managing the Tuskegee Public Health Ethics Program. In these roles, she leads and coordinates multidisciplinary teams and work groups uh, and provides technical assistance for intervention development and program implementation for disadvantaged and underserved populations. Um, Ms. Valentine received her bachelor's degree in social work for the University of Texas at Austin in 1982, and her master's, master's degree in social work in 1995 from the Clark uh, Atlanta University School of Social Work. Uh, Ms. Valentine. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me so I can still hide behind my mask? <laughs> um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, but this is the first gathering that I've been to of this size. <laughs> I only started going back to church a few months ago, and we stay at our mass, and I'm actually in the choir, and I sing in a mask. So we, we stay true to the mask. But the first question I asked was I asked when um, I was notified only yesterday that I was going to be giving this presentation. I said, "Is it remote?" <laughs> and, and so Dr. Grant said, "No, we need you to be there in person." And I was like, "Okay, Joe, you can do this. You you can you can go back into the world. We're going to have to get ready to do it anyway." So um, so this is my first test case. So I hope I do okay. I'm a little nervous, but uh, <laughs> here I am. The, the other really interesting thing, um, and it was because they had asked Dr. Walensky, our CDC director, so when you get told as a lower bureaucrat in an organization of our size that they need you to fill in for the agency director, that's a little scary too. <laughs> but um, when Dr. Grant started describing what the program was going to be about, and who my speakers, you know, I would be sharing um, this opportunity with, Mrs. Head, Dr. Warren, he was telling me all about them and everything, and, and I finally interrupted him and I said, you know, I'm the project officer for that project. 
And he said, oh. <laughs> and so I know these people very well. There was no coordination in our presentations, but what you're going to hear is basically going to be like the third time's the charm, the message about what the impact of the syphilis study at Tuskegee, the US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, what that means and how it has affected um, the way we interact with public health um, over the years. So it's going to sound like you're going to hear repeating themes, but I think that's, that's OK. I sort of got a little nervous, but then I thought, you know, that's OK. It's third time's the charm. The more you hear it, the more you'll get it, that this is an important sentinel event that happened in the history of this country, but that there are very valuable lessons that we can learn from what happened and lessons that need to change the very dire consequences. So this, you know, Dr. Perrin was a committed public health professional. He was trying to make, you know, get this disease under control with the right techniques and strategies and trying to sort of make a difference because it was really, really wrecking, you know, the economy. People, you know, people couldn't work when they were sick and so it was just a real problem. And I, I took this quote on purpose from a review of the book because it almost sounds a little bit like what we hear today about the economic impact of COVID-19 and how it's affecting the workforce. And we hear so much about the supply line and the shipping and all these issues. And we, it sort of struck me, and maybe that's because I'm a social worker, but why is it everything sort of valued in economic terms? We sort of forget that people have value outside of them being an economic engine in our society. And so, but that seems to be the thing that gets people um, is like, let's focus on what the cost is to our country rather than thinking about the value of human beings. And that might be a problem that we might need to think about. People are not just measured by their economic worth. There are other ways to think of what our value is. So anyway, Dr. Perrin wrote this book, Shadow on the Land, and it was a sentinel event for people. He was kind of a celebrity in his day, a sort of a Anthony Fauci kind of character. He was really, really important. And he really, I, I want to point out again that his motives for really trying to control uh, syphilis was really important and that that was not any, anything sort of wrong or inappropriate. But things got kind of bad in the sense that it became an issue of his methods. So when he became the Surgeon General for the United States and was in charge of the US Public Health Service, the, syphilis, the, the Tuskegee study, or the syphilis study at Tuskegee was underway, started in 1929, and he later became the US Surgeon General. He did not stop the study. And so that's the thing that I think we want to remember here, that he had an opportunity to stop what was happening in Macon County, Alabama, but he did not. So when we think of the syphilis study at Tuskegee, the US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, this is kind of the image that comes into mind. And I found this newspaper article a long time ago, as you can see, 1981. But this image really is the image that people still hold today, this notion that black people were being experimented on by white doctors. And that is the image. That is what people think of. And um, I want to talk about that and in, in, you know, sort of, again, repeat some of the history you've already heard today. But it is important to understand that this image is as real today as it was in 1981 and certainly before then. So just to go over the history, the study began in 1929. It wasn't actually only in Macon County. It was actually throughout, there was six counties throughout the South. And at that point, it was a demonstration study. And what it was trying to do was actually bring health care to African Americans in the, in the South, because in the South, African Americans, as you might imagine, were low priority. 
And so they did not have access to the then syphilis treatments that were available, which were pretty intense. I mean, you, you heard about the syphilis treatment centers because people had to like go somewhere for like two weeks and get extensive treatment and it was pretty intense. And so it just was very resource intensive. And so unfortunately, African Americans in particular were left without any access to the then to those days to the treatment that was available. And so this initial project was about how can we actually increase access to care and get these folks the kinds of health care needs that they have. So again, I want to point out the motive was not the problem. It's just the methods became the problem. So initially, they thought they were doing good. And then, you know, things, money ran out, the depression hit. And so the support for the project began to dwindle. The Rosenwald Fund no longer was there to support it. And so it kind of fell to the federal government to carry the load. And so the study then moved to just one location in Macon County, Alabama. And it turned into a study not of getting people into care, but an observational study to see what would happen if, if the syphilis was left untreated. And so that was, a, that was the first sort of tragic error there that it, you know, this sort of notion of looking at what happens if it's untreated? A study that started out being about access to treatment turned into a study to observe what would happen if it was not treated. And of course, the study went on for 40 years. And I included a photograph here of the US Public Health Service Certificate of Merit that was given to the men who were subjects of the study thanking them, grateful recognition of 25 years of active participation in the Tuskegee Medical Research Study. So that just lets you know that people really sort of did not appreciate the lack of ethics associated with this study. So again, the study went on for 40 years. The subjects were African-American men poor and uneducated was often how we described them, how, what the, was in the National Archives. 399 test subjects, people that was men who actually had the disease. Um, there was also about 200 men who were controls. They did not have the infection. But it's important to think, to remember that people did actually die, that this, this, that this disease is fatal if left untreated that the wives, who often we don't talk about the wives, the mothers, but they, the, they were also at risk because again, it's a sexually transmitted disease and so these untreated husbands were you know, transmitting the infection to their wives. You had children who were born with congenital syphilis and we know how dire that can be and yet that all went on in this course of 40 years. So in 1972, the story broke. Finally, some attention was given to it. There was, you know, the, the traditional response, you know, the congressional committees get together and we have investigations and we have hearings. They ruled that the study was ethically unjustified. And then they agreed at that point that they would pay for, the government, federal government would pay for health services for the men and their families. But then the men themselves said, OK, you lied to us and you betrayed us all these years. Why should we trust the US Public Health Service to be my health care provider? So they did not want that. And they did sue, and things did progress. And they got to a point where it was like, no, we get to choose who our health care providers are. And the federal government pays for it. So it wasn't like they had to just go to the government doctors. And can you blame them for not wanting to go to the government doctors when it was the government doctors who had left them untreated all these years? So when, when all of this broke and the news happened and there were the congressional inquiries, you've heard about things like the Institutional Review Board that started to be a part of medical research, informed consent, 
all of these things came from that, the lessons learned early on about the, the wrongness of this study. But I also want to talk a bit about not just the research implications about how we do our research. I want to talk about programs because, in truth, most of us only encounter public health, not in the research mode, but actually in the programmatic mode. And so I think it's important to remember that this awful study has implications for the way we deliver public health programs. So in 1997, President Clinton initiated this apology, or was and there was a group of people who got together and sort of prompted him to make a move, and he made this national apology. Um, by that time, I was actually at CDC, and ironically, we were working on the development of the syphilis elimination effort. I don't know if many of you have heard of it, but we were trying to, syphilis was still a problem, st and still is a problem, by the way. But we were then, at that point, trying to uh, move on the elimination of the disease when this apology happened. And it was so interesting because at one point I was asked um, to write um, a letter that they thought they would sort of public letter that CDC would then share with the men, the survivors of the study, um, sort of talking about our commitment to eliminating syphilis and why it was so important. And ironically enough, I, I wrote the letter but then I was told, well, we don't want to associate syphilis with Tuskegee, which I thought, really? You think, you think it's not? <laughs> so, but it just shows you that that word, Tuskegee, in, you know, I know it's the U.S. Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee, but it always gets shorthanded into Tuskegee, and Tuskegee makes everybody nervous. And it was like even the folks that I was working with in the agency as we were getting ready to launch the elimination campaign were like, no, we don't want to associate syphilis with Tuskegee. So I think you can then appreciate how this sort of lasting shadow of that study and what happened there really still is across this nation and probably throughout the world. So I. I I chose this image because it also reminds me again of the COVID-19 pandemic and this notion, free tests, free vaccine, and we think that's really good news. And so, you know, why don't people take advantage of these resources that are provided for them? But this is just a reminder that free isn't necessarily good. And so people have a reason to be a little nervous when somebody offers them a free Free health care in a country that really puts a premium on health care as a rule, and you really don't have a good opportunity to often get it, particularly if you're poor. So it's a reminder that, you know, you think it's good news just to tell somebody it's free, just, you know, go get it, it's easy, it's easy accessible, etc. But remember, people remember what free meant last time. And even in the words of Ronald Reagan, and I, I couldn't resist, I noticed a room full of politicians, so I just had to bring up this comment that I think is really telling about how Americans view the rescue kind of notion of government, right? So the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And so that's not just among young African-American men who don't want to get the COVID vaccine. That is across the board. People are not so sure that they trust when the government is coming to deliver something and give you something for free. And so this issue of trust and mistrust is not just an issue among African-Americans. It is an issue of mistrust and trust across the board. And particularly if you're poor, or of color, you're not so sure you see all of this as good news. So that's kind of the landscape. That's kind of the shadow on the land. So I'm going to spend a little time now trying to talk about how we're trying to illuminate that shadow. 
So somebody had said to Dr. Warren, please say something about the Bioethics Center. And I said, oh, not to worry. I'm definitely going to say something about it. But this is a photograph of the Bioethics Center in Tuskegee, Alabama. And this is our attempt to work together to actually change the trajectory of this relationship that has been so detrimental for so many people. And I want to describe some of the really good work that's going on there. And I'm proud to be the project officer, proud that our division funds this particular activity. And it's my honor to have a chance to describe it to you. So the Tuskegee Public Health Ethics Program has some specific purposes and some specific strategies. We want to support public health ethics, training, and practice. We develop partnerships with academic governments and non-governmental institutions, private sector, community stakeholders, all to advance ethical public health practice. We work towards community engagement and we promote public health ethics scholarship and scientific literature. And you notice I'm using the pronoun we because I really do feel like we are partners in this effort and we work together. I work very closely with Dr. Warren and it is very important to think of this not just as a project that the government funds, but it is a project that the government is involved in and is engaged in. It allows us to engage with communities, and like I said, we partner with a variety of people, as you can see here, all about public health ethics scholarship and public health ethics practice. Because what we've learned over the years is that building a diverse public health workforce is also really important and you start early. When we developed the um, Public Health Ethics Internship Program, which I'll describe now, um, it was aimed at undergraduate students, not just gra uh, graduate students or PhD level, but folks who are just sort of figuring out where they want to be and where they want to go in their career. And that was important because you want to get to them early. And doc that was Dr. Warren's brilliant idea to make sure that this fellowship was an opportunity for undergrads to start really building an ethical public health workforce. Part of the program obviously supports the commemoration of the presidential apology. Um, as Mrs. Head pointed out, we're coming up on the anniversaries of many of these events, and it's been really exciting to see that over the years the way these things have evolved. The Public Health Ethics Intensive Course, which is another key component of the program, develops then people who are in the public health field already. So it's not just folks coming in, but people who are already in, and it works on helping with their training and development. And it builds capacity and competency in public health ethics, bioethics, and research ethics among faculty and students at all HBCUs throughout the country. And more importantly, it engages with community leaders to really support the effort. And so you see a couple of photographs, covers of the commemoration event that happens at uh, the Bioethics Center on an annual basis. The last couple of years, it's been virtual. But I would invite you to visit the Tuskegee University Bioethics Center website. You can see recordings of the previous public health commemorations, and you can see the incredible talks and presentations given by thought leaders and public health professionals throughout the country talking about these very vital issues as it relates. And then, of course, the other big exciting thing that is a result of this work is the publication and the founding of the Voices for Our Fathers Legacy Foundation, and there are even they have a newsletter that they publish. And what is really exciting about that is that you see it's not just the federal government, CDC, telling the story, but the Voices for Our Fathers, they are telling their own stories and giving, sharing their own experiences, and that is a really important component. It's not just us repeating and telling what we've learned from them, but they themselves have a voice at the table, and that's what's really important. These are some examples. Although the project is housed in the Division of STD Prevention, what you see here is that we support the internships and fellowships across multiple uh, medical issues that impact the African American community. So you see it's across the board. So yes, these are STD dollars, but they support public health ethics work 
across the, all of the issues that affect populations who are at a disadvantage. So just a little bit more about the outcomes, and I think it's important to highlight outcomes because a lot of times you hear about programs and you hear what, what they propose to do, but these are, I'm able to tell you reports of things that have actually been done, that have been accomplished. So you see here we've been going for a really long time. Um, the commemoration is in its 24th um, event. Um, the Public Health Ethics Intensive, it's at its 10th um, annual event, so this is 10 years that it's been going on. Dr. Warren has led the healing and reconciliation sessions with the families and done extraordinary work bringing out those stories and engaging the people that um, help really advance the lessons being learned here. And then um, beginning in 2013, as I alluded to, we started the actual internships where these young students come and actually work at CDC um, for an eight week period and get a chance to get to know what the agency does and what its inner workings are. So somebody mentioned that it's not fun looking at how we make the sausage, but important, you have to learn how the sausage is made to understand how you can influence how the sausage turns out. So we really do encourage young people to come and be at CDC and get a chance to really understand how the sausage is made so they can influence how the sausage turns out. So again, I think what's really, really important is that's different. What One of the key lessons learned is the value of authentic partnership, that we're not just doing things to people or for people, but we work with people to get things done. And so what you see here is just examples of the work that's been done, one of the newest uh, components of this project has been the annual public health ethics forum. And that again is aimed at existing public health workforce folks who come in and learn about public health ethics in practice. And you can see here the topics that we've covered. And, you, and so we've tried to look across the board at the kinds of issues that really impact not only African American communities, but other communities um, who might it be at some disadvantage, even geographic disparities where you know if you live in rural settings, you're often not able to do or have access to the kind of health care and public health services that you would really need. So we really try to focus on all of those issues and all of that comes from understanding and learning the lessons from the U.S. Public Health Service study of syphilis at Tuskegee. So another feature of Mrs. Head, because again, I want to point out that what's really important, it's not just that CDC has the voice or even that Tuskegee University has the voice, but really and truly that the members of the community and the members of the families have a chance to have their say and talk about their issues. And I think what you saw this morning in, in Mrs. Head's presentation and her participation on that panel, what you see is how eloquent those voices really are. And so I'm excited to see that that is a part of this, that it is not just the academics and the researchers writing about the study and its consequences, but it is actually the communities themselves and the members of those families. So thank you, Mrs. Head. So kind of as I move towards the end of the presentation, I just want to say, so the main thing here is that the main lesson is that we've learned we go together. We work together. We work with communities, not for them or to them, but we work with them. It is a relationship. And so this African proverb, it's easy to go quickly. So when you think about the rollout of our various efforts to sort of urgently get into uh, the issues that are affecting us in a public health situation, what we learn is when you rush into it with that kind of emergency room kind of mentality, then you run over people and you run roughshod over people's values and, and that has consequences. And so I would urge us to work more effectively to build relationships so that we go together, not just, again, doing things to people, but with people. So at CDC, there's a strong commitment to, to health equity and it's not just about the research, it's about the programs that actually are on the ground that make a difference for people. 
We understand the value of measurement and why evaluation is so important. And we understand that when you have rigorous programs with, and you get good data and good evidence, then you can then improve policies that have lasting effect over time. And so all three of these components are necessary, particularly you as legislators. The policies that come out of the state houses and out of the Congress, these things set up what actually happens to people on the ground. And so it's very important that all three of these components are thought through carefully and considered. Um, I want to also point out that it's not, again, just doing good programming. It's that you have to do ethical work. And the Public Health Code of Ethics really is a wonderful guide for that. And what you see here is that a commitment to professionalism and trust that health and safety, yes, is important, but it is no less important to have the trust of communities that you're working with. It's about health justice and equity, interdependence and solidarity, this notion, again, of togetherness, that it is important that we think about human rights and civil liberties. And sometimes those things get short shrift when we're in that kind of urgent mode. We're trying to do sort of an urgent intervention. You forget to think about these particular values, the notion of inclusivity and engagement. These strategies take longer to implement, but they are much more effective and they last longer. So at CDC, we have a strong commitment to looking at what are the structural barriers to achieving health equity? How can we actually achieve health equity? What does it take to do that? It takes an ethical framework. It takes a commitment to understanding the structural barriers to um, actually improving people's health over a sustained period of time. I have been at CDC now for 30 years. Um, sort of funny to say that, but anyway. Um, and when I first got to CDC, we didn't say the word racism. But now we understand that the legacy of racism, racism as it is happening right today, affects public health, and we have to take that into consideration. And so again, these are lessons that have been learned from that shadow on the land, that we have to be much more understanding of that impact and sort of really design our interventions not just to be at the clinical level of the health impact pyramid, but to actually address the base of the pyramid where we can do more and reach more and serve more. I'm going to end by really talking about a particular project from our division, um, the Community-Based Approaches to Reducing STDs, or CARS. Um, STD disparities are one among the worst disparities in our nation. And what you see is that, unfortunately, African Americans are very often most severely impacted by sexually transmitted diseases. And so we've had to really think and Think, rethink how we do STD prevention and control in the U.S. So the CARS goals are real simple. We, we want to reduce disparities, promote sexual health, and advance community wellness. But we do that with a commitment to working with the community. And so when the, we put out the announcement for the awards and people compete, they write a, uh, grant applications, they come in with an application, they, you know, they're judged, and then the, the funds are awarded. And then people find out that the plans that they may have proposed, if they have not developed them with their community in partnership, they actually have to go back to the drawing board. And that's a really challenging thing, because sometimes when we're really busy about being providers and making a difference and serving people, we don't always want to ask them what they want. We want to give them what we think they want or what, they, what we think they need. And so the CARS projects require people to go back and work with their affected communities, engage with them, whether they be adolescents or young adults or men who have sex with men or women or whomever they're working with. They have to work with them to design the intervention. They have to listen to the partners that they're working with and they have to collaborate in an authentic way to develop the intervention carry out the intervention and evaluate the intervention. And what we have found is that that's actually led to sustained efforts even when the money finishes and the project concludes, 
they still get resources to continue on their work. When we've been able to actually effectively get uh, men in particular into healthcare to get them screened and treated for STDs. And we have a toolkit that we make available for states and local municipalities on how to do this kind of work. While it was designed for sexually transmitted diseases, it's not limited to STDs. You can use it for any public health problem or challenge that a community might be facing. And it's available in both English and Spanish. So in summary, what is the most important way to illuminate this shadow, this lasting shadow on the land, is working in a, with a community, with a commitment to community engagement and public health ethics that really leads to authentic partnerships and interventions that address social determinants of health and making sure that one thing that was missing, and somebody mentioned that this morning, is accountability. We have to be accountable, not just as CDC, but also as providers and other folks who are involved in serving the community. So as I wrap up, I just want to think back about the men who were the subjects of the US Public Health Service syphilis study at Tuskegee. You know, they got involved with the study because they were looking for health care. And they were promised that they were getting health care. And they were kept in the study because they were being assured all along that they were getting health care. That is how valuable but how rare health care is for a lot of people still in our country. And so when you think about it, these men just wanted to be treated right. They just wanted to get their needs met, but they were lied to, they were betrayed. And in, this was intentional for 40 years because people thought they knew best for somebody else. They didn't ever ask them, you know, they weren't, in, you know, they didn't question, do you want to be a part of this effort? We're, we're trying to learn this important information about this disease. They never had a chance to have a say. Somebody made all the decisions for them for the benefit of what they thought were their high motives. But what we know were not, that their methods were wrong. But I want you to remember that these men were in that situation because health care is so difficult to get for so many people, and they were trying to get health care. So this is taken from one of our campaigns from STD Awareness Month, this notion about treat me right. Just think if we had treated those men right. And that seems like such a, come on folks, how hard is that? That's the shadow. And that is why people to this day, not just black, not just white, not, who are not sure they're gonna get treated right. So what are we gonna do differently to ensure that people can have a little bit more confidence? How can we become more trustworthy to help people in? And I think we can't just do it by dismissing their skepticism because you have a right to be skeptical when there's a history of not being treated right. So I would just say that the one way we can get past these barriers and distrust and p make people choosing you know, to do all kinds of other things rather than go to the doctors, first you gotta make it accessible. But secondly, you gotta make it trustworthy. And the way we do that is by establishing relationships with the people we're trying to serve and treating them as we would like to be treated. And that's right. Thank you. Let's give Ms. Uh, Valentine another round of applause. Also, let's give uh, Dr. Warren another round of applause. The purpose of the plenary session this morning and the luncheon session today was to give you the facts. Uh, the facts about the uh, syphilis study, 
uh, to uh, provide you and arm you with the inf information you need to go out to your constituents, to your friends and family about what really happened, the safeguards that were put in place as, as a result of what happened, and to give you the tools to uh, address this whole trust issue. So thank you for ending on the issue of trust, uh, Ms. Valentine, because that is so important. So uh, thank you all for listening. If you have more questions, please reach out to NBCSL staff, in particular Joe Grant. Uh, we have materials that we can share with you that you can use uh, in your communities and, and the work that you do. So without further ado, I'll call up uh, President Billy Mitchell to close us out. Please, let's give uh, uh, Melissa Bishop Murphy another round of, of applause. We cannot thank our luncheon and our, our session sp uh, uh, sponsor, Pfizer, enough uh, for what they do, because it's an, an incredible partnership that creates an cre uh, incredible synergy for us to get this kind of information that makes us better legislators so that we can serve our constituents. Now, I'm, I'm hesitant right now to dismiss us because I had invited some special guests to join us at this time. I understand that they have just completed the credentialing process and uh, they should be joining us shortly. So let me do this in the interim. Once we leave this location, we will have five concurrent policy sessions going on. It is important that you go to one of those policy sessions. Please do not go and socialize in the hallway or back to your room. It's important that you go to one of those policy sessions. We have some incredible sponsors that have sponsored the uh, concurrent sessions and they would like to see you in the place. And uh, so please go by and see them in, the, in International Salon 6, which is one level down. Racism as a public health crisis, how it impacts the African American community and under, other underserved populations. If that interests you, that's in Salon 6, one level down. Salon 7, racial equity and economic development, closing the equity gap through programs and policy. That's in Salon 7. And Salon 8, disparities in healthcare, cardiovascular disease and sickle cell disease, how it impacts the African American community and other underserved populations. In Salon 9, one level down, recycling in crises, advancing the circular e economy in your state. Uh, I will be attending that one. Uh, Coca-Cola is a sponsor there. We need to see you in that place as well. And International 10, uh, establishing equitable state coverage and access for therapies to treat sickle cell disease. Uh, all of those are extraordinary concurrent sessions will allow you to be able to interact uh, more so than we have the time to do with these larger groups but please go and see them. Now let me give you some other directions while I have the time. At 2.30, the United States Secretary of Housing and Urban Development uh, is going to be our keynote speaker, and that will be where we had the other policy session in the Marquise Room A and B. Uh, they will, uh, she will be here. Um, and we've, we've made uh, special arrangements, uh, evidently for the Ohio delegation, as well as her sorority sisters and some others. So please be timely for that. That is at 2.30, the U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Following that, at 3.15, we're going to have the President of the Republic of Ghana. Uh, and he's going to talk about our international policy initiatives and how we can share economic opportunities. 
there were a couple of legislators that have backgrounds, they, they were born in Ghana. If you would come and see me now, uh, the Secret Service is, uh, needs your name. So if after we leave here, if you, the, those couple of legislators that I talked to that were born in Ghana, if you would come and see me so that we can see what we can do about a, 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 a meeting there as well. With that, where's Dr. Grant? Is, I think we are going to dismiss from this place and may you go to Salon 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10 and maybe we'll have our special guest show up at our uh, Georgia Night Entertainment tonight. Yeah, let's, let's check with her because I understand they may be right outside the door. Thank you, thank you. I, I can also talk about our special event for those who are credentialed uh, for this conference. The buses will leave at 5 p.m., I understand, to take us to the Tabernacle. The Tabernacle, for those of you who don't know, is a concert venue. Our entertainment for tonight, uh, among others, will be Tamar Braxton and Anthony Hamilton. And uh, it is just for our group here. We have also have uh, Jermaine Dupree stopping by and a few other uh, entertainers that wish to come by for that as well. Let me, s Let me call up our CEO and see if it's proper to dismiss you at this time. Are they coming in? I, I, I don't say that. I have some, so we're going to go to the sessions in and let's let them come to the tabernacle tonight. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are dismissed to the policy sessions. <laughs>